In recent times, Catholics have been asking, what is happening in the Church? Catholic commentators have much to say about cause and effect, but one thing which I recognize must be emphasized is that there still remains one true Church, even when she appears undefended against her enemies. But those who are faithful know that is not true. We will know it when we are well familiar with our sacred history. We should know and trust in Christ's promise to be with his church until the consummation of the world. We should remember that each one of us is a confirmed soldier of Christ, and each one of us have a soul to save. Each one of us in our time on earth have an important purpose and role to carry out, even if that purpose and role is known only by heaven. We should not forget that we who are living on earth are members of the church militant, which is only one of the church's three divisions. In other words, the church militant must not forget the communion of saints, not merely the communion of saints on earth with each other, but also with the other two divisions, the church triumphant and the church suffering. Those who serve the Lord sincerely and with all their hearts, their minds, and their strength believe in God, his angels, and his saints stand firm in the faith, which was, as we read in Jude 3, handed down to the saints. You're listening to Genesis 315. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. I'm Mariana Bartold, the author of Fatima, The Signs and Secrets, and Guadalupe, Secrets of the Image, both which are available at Amazon. By the way, if you find any value in the content of this podcast, kindly consider subscribing to Genesis 315 and liking this or any of my other episodes. And if you're interested in any of my books or the work from which I will be sharing, you will find in the description box those links. Okay, let's get started. In this episode, we look to the symbolism of the parable of the mustard seed, as our Lord himself told it, and as it's recorded in Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32, because in its symbolism, this parable addresses that which I've already mentioned with some depth. This is the parable, as it reads in Matthew Another parable he proposed unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is the least indeed of all seeds, but when it is grown up, it is greater than all herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and dwell in the branches thereof. Having previously examined the first picture of the church which our Lord has drawn and placed before us for our instruction in the parable of the good seed and the cockle, from which I've been quoting from the book Divine Parables Explained, even though um, at times I am giving you almost full excerpts and other times abbreviating it a bit to make it easier to understand. Every one that hath eyes to see and ears to hear must understand from it that the good seed so uniform throughout the field could be no other than the Holy Catholic Church, which was first planted by Jesus Christ, the Goodman, who preserves and governs it to the end of time. As previously mentioned, the cockle, so manifold in its kind, plainly represents the mass of errors that have divided all those who separate themselves from the Catholic Church into many hundreds of different belief systems, all of them naturally hostile to the good seed. We are now about to take up another picture of the Church, which the master hand of the dear Savior has also executed. And after making the same comparison, we shall find, as before, the Catholic Church. Now, as the priest who wrote the book says in the next part, 
Before doing so, however, I wish to remind my readers that I desire to see acknowledged the claims which the Catholic Church alone possesses of being the true Church of Jesus Christ, not as a mere favor, but from conviction, produced by a sincere and impartial examination of her faith and doctrine, not for our advantage or that of the Church, but for the sake of the souls concerned, that after all will be the real gain or losers in the end, and whose salvation we most earnestly desire. To which I add, Amen. To continue. Since God commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, therefore we cannot remain unmoved at the sight of so many immortal souls in danger of perishing eternally without at least giving a friendly warning, which, if accepted, will lead them securely to the happy mansions of the blessed. It is certainly as important for every non-Catholic to know and embrace the true Church as it is for every Catholic to live according to her true teaching and persevere in her communion. But let us return to the parable, which opens with these words. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. The man who is here represented as the owner of the field can be no other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Otherwise, what relation could this parable have to the kingdom of heaven? It was this God-made man who alone had the right and the power to establish a religion equally binding upon all mankind and forming the law by which he governs the church on earth, the militant kingdom of heaven, which resembled the mustard seed by its obscure and lowly beginning. For who could be less in the eyes of worldly wisdom than its divine founder and his twelve associates? He, the son of a carpenter, as they said, not possessing even the necessities of life, and they, poor, unlettered fishermen. Nevertheless, his mustard seed took root and flourished, so that its branches reached to the very heavens. For this kingdom, represented by the mustard seed, comprises three divisions, all attached to the same tree and holding close relations to each other. The first and most beautiful of these divisions constitutes all those who, having conquered their corrupt nature by a holy violence and overcome the seductions of the world, the flesh, and the devil, have already closed their earthly combat. Called to the presence of their king, they are crowned by him as his faithful warriors and consequently are termed the church triumphant. The second are those who, though faithful, were not wholly free from blemish at the time of their departure from this life, but nevertheless will be saved, yet so as by fire, as it is said in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 15. These constitute the church suffering. The third portion of this great mustard tree is that of the members of the true church on earth, styled the church militant. And these three parts of Christ's kingdom communicate with each other. The tree that rises so majestically above all the surrounding plants and herbs is the identical tree that was contained in the seed, no matter how small it may have been. And here is the answer for those persons who, wishing to justify their separation from the true church, maintain that the present Catholic Church, although founded by Jesus Christ and his apostles as the little mustard seed, is no longer the same church that it was in the days of the apostles. They claim that many powers have been usurped and exercised by the Pope and his clergy, which were never exercised in the primitive church, that almost every century brings new innovations in matters of worship and discipline, which are not mentioned in Holy Scripture and were not known among the first Christians. That Christ granted special powers to his apostles and their successors, no man can deny who pretends to believe in the Bible. After all, our Lord said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, etc. He also said, As the Father has sent me, I also send you for the same end, with the same powers. He also said, To thee I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven. And we see all of these quotes in Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 21, Matthew 16, 19. Feed my lambs, 
feed my sheep. What these powers were and the meaning of exercising them were certainly best known to those who received them and were transmitted by them to their successors as holy things not to be given to dogs and as precious pearls not to be cast before swine, as we read in Matthew 7, 6. Suppose even that we were to grant, which by no means we could, that we have no evidence that these powers were ever exercised by the apostles. This would prove nothing against the fact of their being granted by our divine Lord to them and their successors. Besides, no proof can be alleged to show that they were not enforced by the apostles, as not all of their actions have been recorded, but only a few of them. On the contrary, we have incontestable historical proof that these powers were exercised by the immediate successors of the apostles, as well as by all those who came afterwards. The true history of the Church beautifully illustrates the growth and development of the mustard seed and the exercise of those powers granted by Christ to the head of the Church and his subordinate aides, the bishops and the priests, whenever an occasion required them. These powers being given in general terms and to a limited extent, although a very high extent, reaching as far as good and truth reaches, were also to be used with discretion, according to times and circumstances. Those charged with their administration were to be like St. Peter, faithful and wise stewards whom the Lord hath set over his family to give them their measure of wheat, as is taught in Luke 12, verse 42. Not at random, nor at all times in the same measure and indiscriminately, but in due season. The sins of some were to be forgiven, those of others retained, etc., At one time they should bind, at another loosen. And so, as the church grew and extended, these powers were used and made manifest to the world. She is, therefore, the church of all ages and bears the marks of every century of her life. Out of the root of Jesse, which is the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God, there came forth a rod, as we read in Isaiah 11, verse 1. The rod is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. This rod became the trunk of a tree through St. Peter and his successors as vicars of Christ on earth. The nations converted to Christianity, also known as Catholicism, by the preaching of the gospel, form the branches that bring forth leaves, flowers, and fruit, as long as they remain united to the trunk from which they derive nourishment, fecundity, and life. If some branches have, in the course of time, decayed, dried up, withered, fallen off, or were cut off, they did not in any way hurt the main tree, which in some cases sprouted anew and brought forth young and vigorous branches instead, with fresh leaves and fruits, but never for an instant lost its innate vitality. To say that a tree, a hundred years old, is not the identical tree or plant which was first sown and which produced this ancient tree, would be ridiculous, since it would imply that the seed never sprang up, and so the tree could have no origin. If Jesus Christ never gave his church any legislative power, and she exercised such power in succeeding ages, her identity might well be impugned nowadays. Since this power was given her at the very time of her foundation by Christ himself, and she makes use of such power after hundreds of years, because she had no need or opportunity of doing so before, no one can on this account deny her identity or say she's not the same church or that she has no power. The little mustard seed, when it is grown up, is greater than all herbs and becometh a tree, as our Savior said. Now, if the tree is the church of Jesus Christ, the herbs are her rivals the various false assemblies, with this difference, that the tree was planted by the man in the field. And as we know, the man in the field was Jesus Christ, whereas these herbs were planted by others. 
or were the spontaneous productions of the soil. Therefore the tree is of heavenly origin, but the herbs of earthly origin. And no matter how much these herbs may pretend to be the true church, they bear too plainly the marks of falsehood. They are too small. For the marks of the true church of Jesus Christ are not only of unity and of sanctity and apostolicity, but also universality, otherwise known as Catholicity. We have it from the lips of our divine Lord himself in this parable, where he shows us that his church, once planted, shall flourish and exceed in numbers and magnitude all the rivals that surround her and will continue to do so until the end of time. No matter what heresies and schisms arose or will yet arise during the 2,000 years and more of her existence, no matter how many thousands or millions of souls were torn from her maternal embrace, still the number of her faithful and devoted children remained, despite those, as is revealed in 2 John 5 verse 9, who revolted and remained no more in the doctrine of Christ. For as we are told in the Old Testament, even now there is a remnant saved out of grace. Now don't forget, I am broadcasting somewhere in the noon hour, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so, until the next time, may God bless you, and may Our Lady Mary keep you and yours under her starry mantle. Salve, Regina.